So if you all bow your head with me, I'm just going to pray quickly for this sermon. Dear Lord, um, thank you so much for this opportunity to preach today. Um, Lord, I pray that my words would not be my words, but they would be your words, and that you would speak through me. I pray that I would not mislead anyone, but I would preach your word with truth um, and know that your word contains the truth. In your name we pray. Amen. So today, uh, I'm just going to start with a quick little story that's going to kind of uh, illustrate our main point for today. Uh, so this past summer, I worked as, as a counselor in training at a summer camp, um, uh, and, and as a part of this uh, training, we had to spend three days and three nights alone in the woods with no food. And I was super, super hungry during this, right? If anyone here is a fan of cravings, I thought about the cravings cowboy burger for like hours, right? Hours on end. And that's a whole new kind of focus, right? And so uh, back to kind of the beginning of how this, uh, this, this solo, as we called it, began. Um, we were around a lake in the middle of the wilderness. And uh, two things you need to know is that on this day, we were very late because we had gotten lost as we were canoeing to this lake. And so it was already getting dark, and it was pouring rain, right? We're all soaked through to the skin. We're miserable. I'm in a canoe with David Over. Some of you might know him. Um, and so we canoe our way, uh, and we get to the, to the shore. And we, we drag our canoe up on the shore, and then we have to walk 50 paces into the wilderness and put a canoe paddle down. We lean this canoe paddle up against the tree, and that's like our reference point, right? Uh, so we know that uh, where our canoe is, if something goes wrong, we can go, come and find this canoe paddle, and then we'll be safe. So we go over, and we go 200 paces this way, and we set up my campsite, and then we go back and we find the canoe paddle again, and then we go 200 paces the other way, and we set up David's campsite. And so all this is over, and we say goodbye, and I set off. It's still pouring rain, uh, and it's really dark now. And my headlamp decides that this is a perfect time to stop working. So I have this dim, dim headlamp, and I can only see like 10 feet in front of me, right? And I'm stumbling through the woods for a while, and it's dark, and it's pouring rain. And what you need to know is this is 10 out of 10 wilderness, which means that if there's a medical emergency, I'm going to die because there's nothing they can do for you. You're too far from society. And so I'm, getting, I'm starting to get nervous because, you know, hypothermia. <laughs> and so I, I walk through the woods for a while, and I try to count my paces, and I'm looking down because I can't see anything. And all of a sudden I look up, and I look around me, and I realize that I can't see the shore anymore. Right? I, I'm, I'm completely lost in the woods. I have no idea what's around me. And I look around and I just, I realize I'm lost, and this is a very, very bad situation. And so I just sit down and I pray. And I, I pray that God would help me find this canoe paddle. And then I don't know why I did this. It might have been mild hypothermia or something, but my cold brain tells me, oh, just, just walk towards the shore. Uh, forget about paces, forget about, you know, your, your knowledge of the space around you. So I just start to stumble through the woods. I have no idea where I'm going. And I'm stumbling through the woods towards the shore, and all of a sudden my foot kicks something, and I look down, and I've literally kicked over the canoe paddle. And that was such an incredible, incredible moment. Because at that moment, I felt God's love for me so clearly, right? There was no chance that I should have found that canoe paddle. There was no chance I should have found my way to safety. I was in a very, very bad situation. I couldn't do it by myself. And somehow, some way, God allowed me to trip over this canoe paddle, to literally trip over it. He, he put this, this visible symbol of his love right in my path, and I kicked it over, and I knew that God was there with me. And that night, I felt secure in God's love, right? I knew that he was there for me. And I want to ask you all, have you ever had moments? Have you ever had moments where you know beyond the shadow of a doubt that God loves you and God's there for you and he's, he's looking out for you, he's caring for you? And then for others of you, I want to ask the question, have you ever had moments where it doesn't end like that? Moments where you don't stumble across a canoe paddle and you feel like you're, you're lost in the woods. And the reason that I ask this is, as I mentioned before, we're talking about God's love. And everyone knows that God loves us, right? The other week... I was hanging out with my nephew, and my nephew is like two years old, and he runs up to me, and he says, Uncle Jack, God loves me. And it occurred to me, like, this little man is two years old. He can't even form memories yet. He's not going to remember this, and he already knows that God loves him. And so we all know in our head that God loves us, but we don't always see and we don't always feel God's love, right? And I, I think several things can cause this. Guilt, shame, the sufferings of this life. Maybe a toxic home life or going through a tough breakup. 
thinking that our works and our actions can save us. All these things can cause this type of feeling uh, that we're not seeing and we're not feeling God's love. That there's no canoe paddle in our path and we're just wandering through the woods. We're completely lost. And this is something that's absolutely guaranteed as Christians. We will face trials. We will face, as you'll see in this passage later on, tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, danger, the sword, depression, anxiety, purposelessness, and at the end of it all, death, right? We're all going to die, and this is something that we need to think about if we're going to think about God's love. But I think that understanding God's love for us can fundamentally change the way that we live and how we see ourselves, what our identity is. And so I'm hoping that through this passage today, we'll learn to ultimately find identity in the security of God's love. So if you all want to turn with me, we're going to be looking at Romans 8, verses 31 through 39. I have it up on the screen. It's broken into two because it's, it's, it's a whole unit of a passage, I must say. I'm going to read this passage for us today. It says, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, Christ Jesus is the one who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so in this passage, Paul sets out to answer two main questions, and we're going to look at those today. First, we have, how much does God love us? And then, if God loves us, well, why should I care? I mean, a tree can love me, but that doesn't do anything for me, eternally speaking. And so today we're going to go through Paul's take on both of these questions. So... Let's start with the first, right? How much does God love us? In verse 32, uh, if you'll, you'll look with me, it says, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Right, so what's that saying? That's saying God, Jesus died. God gave up his son. And if God could send his son to not only die, but to bear the weight of our sin and all the ways that we mess up, then what else could he possibly spare? Right? Because he's already given us everything. He's already had eternal separation with Christ. And, and because of that, there's nothing else he could ever hold back. And that's why we are secure in God's love for us. It's unshakable. We're secure. But it gets even better than that, right? Because if you'll, if you'll look uh, up to verse 34 with me, it says that Christ, right? Christ is the one who died, and he is indeed is interceding for us. He's at the right hand of God. And he's interceding for us. And so to intercede is to step in on behalf of someone else. So what this means is that Jesus saw the contents of our hearts, saw those deep, those dark sins that only we know about, that we don't want anyone to know about. Jesus saw all of that, and then he died for that. And in my opinion, that would have been perfectly enough, right? He saw the things about me that only I know, that no one else knows, and he still died and he suffered uh, separation from God as a result of that. But he said, no, that's not enough. Not only am I going to die, I'm going to intercede for you. And so what that means is he's sitting at the right hand of God. He's sitting right next to God and advocating on our behalf, even for us, for all the ways that we mess up, right? Not even our deepest and our darkest sins were a deal breaker. Nothing, nothing could separate us from how much he loves us, right? Right? Nothing could scare him away from loving us. And so to summarize the first question, God loves us so much that he gave us everything, including his son. And Jesus not only died for our sins, but also chooses to intercede and to advocate for us before God. So now that we know how much God loves us, 
Let's look at why we should care, right? Uh, we'll look at verse 34 here. Look at the kind of odd way that it's worded, right? It says, in verse 34, it says, Jesus Christ is the one who died. And that's kind of like bad writing almost, right? It should just say, Jesus Christ died. But no, it says, Jesus Christ is the one who died. And so because of that, we can assume that Christ Jesus is the one who died, and the one who rose, and the one who is at the right hand of God interceding for us. What does that mean? That means Jesus, and Jesus alone, was able to do those things. No one else could, could die and could, could take our sins away and then intercede for us in front of God. And that's why we should care, right? Christ Jesus and Christ Jesus alone is able to do this. Nobody else can. Nobody else can save us. And because of that, we're secure, right? We know that there's only one way to, 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 to be free from our sin, to escape condemnation, and that's through Christ Jesus. And that's why we should care. So we've seen that not only does Christ Jesus love us, but that it's really important that he loves us because he's the only person that ultimately uh, has love that can cleanse our sin. And so a lot of you might be sitting here thinking, well, this is all well and good to think that God loves me and I can you know, see it in this passage here. But with all this suffering, with all the things I'm going through, how can God still be good? How can God still love me? Right? With all the suffering in the world, how can God possibly <clears throat> still be loving? And suffering is everywhere in life, right? Like, we can see it on a global level. Literally, any time you turn on the news, some new group is being killed. Someone new is being oppressed. So much so that we're pretty much numb to it. We don't, we don't think twice when we see the news. Uh, generally, if someone's being killed, we're just numb to all this suffering and all the wrong in the world. And then we see suffering on a personal level. With things like getting rejected by that girl or guy you like. Or having a toxic home life. Or maybe a parent's divorce. Or being put down. Or maybe bullied by others. And so we see suffering both on a broad, on a global level, and then we see it on a personal level. And each of us is deeply affected by suffering, so how can there still be a God who we say is good, and a God who we say that loves us? And God knows, right? He knows that this is a difficult question to grapple with, and I say that because his word reflects that fact. If we look here in verse 36, Paul quotes a verse, right? See that, that separated paragraph, it says, it is written. Paul quotes a verse, and that comes from Psalm 44. It says, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. That's a vivid image, right? We're like poor, defenseless animals being murdered without any way of saving ourselves and without any way of rescuing us. And so that's, that's pretty vivid. That's a pretty big claim to, to make against God. And so uh, quickly, I just want all of us uh, to have a little discussion. I'm going to um, stop speaking for a second here. And we're going to look at Psalm 44. Um, verses 8 to 13 kind of summarize it. If you have a Bible, just turn to, this, turn to these verses. And with the people around you, just look at them. And I want you to look at the question uh, of what the Israelites are saying about God. What attributes of God do the Israelites point to here? We'll give you two or three minutes. We're going to kind of break out of our discussion time. Um, I hope you all were interested by this passage because I was personally fascinated by it the first time I read it. Because the answer, I think, that most of you probably came to is they don't say much good about God. In fact, they say very bad things about God in Psalm 44. It's pretty critical of God. And uh, I don't know if any of you guys got the chance to read the whole psalm. It's pretty long. But all of it is the Israelites lashing out in anger against God. Because what's happening is they're being murdered. They're being, you know, uh, crushed by, by enemy armies, and they feel like they're a laughingstock among the people. Right? It says here they're facing derision and scorn. Right? God is supposed to be this great uh, person who's protecting them and who's with them, but they're being, they're being taken to town by the enemy armies. Right? They're being murdered. And so what I want to ask you all here today is, have you ever lashed out against God? Have you ever felt like, despite how hard you work to draw near to God and to be a good Christian and to be a good person, have you ever felt like God rejects you, right? Because here the Israelites say that they have heard from their parents about the good work that God has done in the past. That's verses 1 through 8. And I think for a lot of us who were maybe raised in Christian homes, who have Christian parents, we're the same way. 
We've been told about, oh, uh, here's the way that I became a Christian. Here's the way that God has worked in my life from our parents, right? And, and from our leaders and people who are older than us. We're told that, right? Verses 8 and 9, look with me. It says, in God we have boasted continually, and we will give thanks to your name forever. So the Israelites are, are following all the rules. They're doing everything right. Then it says, but you, but you, God, have rejected us and disgraced us. Later in verse 9, it says, you have sold your people for a trifle, demanding no high price for them. Right? He's saying, you've discarded us. You didn't care about us. You, you, you demanded no high price for us. You didn't care. And the thing that's crazy about Psalm 44 is that there's no happy ending. Right? In Romans 8, when we look at that, it ends on a high note because it says, despite our suffering, things end well. We're more than conquerors, is what it says in Romans 8. But Psalm 44 doesn't have that type of, you know, happy, glorious ending. You know how Psalm 44 ends? It ends with the Israelites crying out, where are you, God? Where are you? Come and save us. Where are you? We can't see you. And this is kind of the definition of a weird flex, isn't it? Like, in this, in this Bible, I'm relating to you guys. But in this Bible, in this book that's meant to convince us to believe in God and to glorify him and to believe in his love, there's an entire chapter dedicated completely to doubting God's love, right? There's no happy ending. It just says, we don't, we don't feel God. God isn't with us. And that's the whole point of the chapter. It's a weird flex, God. But the power here is not what God says or what anyone says in this chapter, but the power is in what God doesn't say and what isn't said in this chapter, right? God doesn't see the Israelites dying and he doesn't say, oh, I'm sorry for your loss. He doesn't say, oh, your loved ones, they're in a better place now. He doesn't say, oh, you're anxious, just relax. He doesn't say, oh, you're depressed? Well, maybe you should pray more. Maybe you should be a better Christian. He simply listens as the Israelites rage against him. And what can we take from this? We can know that God understands that doubts will come. And that when we suffer, it feels like God isn't with us. And sometimes we don't feel his love. And he knows what you're going through, right? And he knows that it's hard. And sometimes there isn't a perfect answer that we can see for our suffering, right? Sometimes when we feel lost, God doesn't put a canoe paddle right in our path. We don't feel God's love in that transcendent and obvious way. What we can take from that is that it's okay not to be okay. It's okay not to be okay. There are people in this room right now that I know are suffering from depression and anxiety. For some of us, it was difficult to get out of bed this morning because of how terrible we feel and how much we're suffering. There are some people in this room dreading every passing moment today because they know that tomorrow they'll have to go back to a school where they're gonna be put down and they're gonna be bullied like they are every single day, right? For others though, for others, suffering may be less painful, right? Maybe you've been growing a lot in your faith and you've been you know, enjoying school and, and Avengers Endgame just came out. You're looking forward to seeing that, and you haven't, you haven't seen any spoilers yet, unlike me. But it's not like your suffering is any less important, right? God still values that suffering, even if it may be less painful than someone else's. And so the verse I want to look at, it comes right before uh, the, the passage we're looking at in Romans 8. It's one of the most quoted verses in Romans. Romans 8.28, a lot of you might know this. Right? It says here, For those who love God... All things work together for good. But like we just said, there's a lot of us going through depression and anxiety and having a terrible home life, right? So obviously, good doesn't mean comfort. Obviously, good doesn't mean an easy life. All things don't work together for us to be comfortable and for things to be easy. But good doesn't mean comfort, but it means purpose, right? Good means purpose. Because without God, there's no overarching theme. There's no reason to live. There's no purpose to your suffering. You're suffering for nothing. There's no overarching theme to your life. But with God, 
And I find this comforting. We get the blessed, blessed assurance of sovereignty, right? Christ is with us. God is in control. We may not see it, but there is some good. And there is some good that we can believe in. And we can know that even when we don't see it, and even when we don't feel like things are good, God is good and things are good. So, what does this mean for identity? My hope is that uh, we can change the way that we see ourselves, change our identity, and change the way that we live in light of the security of God's love. Right? Because we talked about how God's love gives us security. What's the opposite of security? The opposite of security is insecurity. And in verse 35, right here, Paul lists seven possible sources of insecurity. Look at this. He says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? A lot of things to be insecure about, particularly nakedness. That's kind of weird, Paul. But he claims that not a single one of them is able to separate us from the love of Christ. Look here at verse 37. We are more than conquerors over insecurities and trials, but it doesn't stop there. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. But if God's love is greater, for, but if, if God's love for us is greater than, look at verse 39, anything else in all creation, why do we still feel insecure? I think we feel insecure in ourselves, particularly as teenagers, because our identity is misplaced. So should our, be, should our identity be in what others think of us? No, look at verses 38 and 39. Right? It, it, to summarize, it says that nothing on earth can compare to the love of Christ. And I think society at large would tend to agree with this point. We're told that we should not care about what other people think about us. We shouldn't compare ourselves to other people. But we should, we should just care about what we think about ourselves. We should be happy with ourselves. We should love ourselves. So is that where we should put our identity? I think once again, Paul says no. Right? In all of chapters 7 and 8, Paul mulls over the fact that the body... Uh, is a constant battle with the mind because Paul knows what he should do and he knows uh, what God's law is and he loves that, but his flesh, his body, does what he doesn't want to do. He's imperfect. And so ultimately, putting our identity in ourselves leads to disappointment because we'll never be able to live up to what we want to live up to and we'll never be able to live up to Christ's law. And so we shouldn't put our identity in what others think of us. We shouldn't put our identity in what we think of us I think what Paul says here is that we should put our identity in the security of God's love because that's what's unchangeable and that's what's perfect. We are more than conquerors. So before we close here, let's just summarize a little bit. We started with the premise that God's love gives us security. We thought about how much God loves us. That was question one. And then question two, we then asked why we should care that God loves us. Then we said that God is with us even when we don't feel like he is, right? Psalm 44, there's not always a happy ending. And then finally, we talked about how the security of God's love affects our identity and how we can find identity in the security of God's love. But before we close today, I just want to leave you with this. After I found that canoe paddle on the first night of my solo, uh, when I was out in the woods alone, I managed to get my way back to my campsite and I dried myself off and put on my nice warm fleece and I got in my sleeping bag and I was secure. I felt safe. Right? And I think similarly, at the end of this life, we as Christians will be with God forever and will be completely comforted and will be joyful in the security of his love. Right? Everything will be great. There will be no more suffering, no more pain. But as high schoolers, as high school students, we don't often think about death, do we? Right? Like, why should I care about the end of my life when I'm just trying to make it through today, when I'm just trying to make it through this week, through the end of the school year? We don't, we don't have that vision until the end. And so what I want to leave you with is this amazing, amazing truth that I found so comforting uh, while writing this sermon. When I was stumbling through those woods, and when I was lost and I was alone, God was just as much with me then, and he loved me just as much as when I was secure and safe in my sleeping bag. And so even this coming week, when you feel like you're lost, and you feel like you're stumbling through this life, and you don't know where you're going, and your headlamp is broken, and you can't see in front of you, just take that next step because God still loves you and he promises to still love you. And you're just as secure then as we will be at the end of this life. And we're just as secure in God's love and there's nothing that we can do to change that fact. 
So we're now going to we're going to sing a song and we're going to try to kind of reflect on the security of God's love and how that affects us. But first, can I just pray for you all? Dear Lord, I thank you for your love, for the security of your love, God, that, that you made it clear that in a world where nothing is permanent, where nothing stays together, that we can do nothing to change your love and we can do nothing to change your mind, right? And that even, even through our deepest and darkest sins, none of those were a deal breaker. None of those changed the way you felt about us, Lord. And we thank you for the way that that affects our identity and that we can put our identity in you. I pray that as we go through this week, God, we would feel your love with us. You would walk through us step by step, just like you promised to do. In your name we pray. Amen.